I loved California. I, California, like, there was a point in my life where I was all about, I'm gonna get a tattoo that says California grown. Like, that is me. I used to love everything about it. Look at our weather outside today. Sunny in 72, we're not having a hurricane. Diverse geography, talented and diverse population. Hollywood, the entertainment business, beautiful men and women. It's really got everything. I mean, it's a nation state. It had the fifth largest economy in the world. It has a four of the top universities rated of the top 25 in the world. So it was very hard to destroy that inheritance. But we did, and how do you quantify that? The fact that 300,000 more people left the state than moved in, in light of California being such a wonderful place, is, is unbelievable. People are leaving to go to places that are what once was known as hell, hot Texas or desert Nevada, that have become paradise in their mind. And we took paradise and turned it into hell. My name is Siamai Korami. I was born and raised in Iran. And I lived in Mexico, Mexico City, and lived in China. But when I came to California, it was like paradise. It was safe, it was always sunny, you could surf all year, it was clean, it was spotless. There were also a ton of opportunities here. My entire family ended up moving here and I built a technology company. And we finally made it. I really had the best time of my life here. But during the last 10 years, things have really changed. I was in San Francisco, we parked our car in the parking lot and there was a gentleman that drove by and started yelling Please don't park your car here. Somebody's gonna break into it. There are gonna be two crews that are gonna break into the cars by noon. I try and warn people parking their cars not to leave anything in their cars. And I've probably saved about 400 people from, from like getting ripped off because nobody else is doing it. By the time you know the cops show up, they're gone. I went to dinner in LA to a really good restaurant in a good neighborhood. It was nine o'clock, we were done with the dinner, and my friend told me, are you sure you're gonna walk to your car? He said, where did you park? I said, a block away. He said, are you sure you're gonna walk to your car? And I was shocked, I was like, I'm a grown up man, and it's a block away, we're in a good neighborhood in LA, it's 9 p.m., is it really getting that bad? Around the same time, I was asked to do a show for Epoch Times. It's called California Insider. I didn't think anybody would watch the show. But I ended up interviewing over 300 people, explaining California's issues and challenges in the last two years. The first video to go viral was an interview about people leaving the state, an issue no other media talked about in depth. So I decided to fill the gap and started digging. This is the story. You know this, there are many small business owners across the Bay Area who are fed up with the crime and other problems impacting their bottom line. Oakland community plagued by brazen crime. Businesses and residents say this is just the tip of the iceberg. Greg, these are small businesses just trying to make a living. A lot of them have also installed surveillance cameras. Many of them are at their wit's end on how to fight this problem. So they broke this one. They've tried to break this one, they've broke this one, they broke this one, they broke this one. It's about $800 to replace the front door, and then they broke another window that cost about $1,500. So in two days, I had to pay $2,300 in windows. Since we put those signs up there, it actually seems no one's tried to break in since. So maybe it is working. You got a bike lock cut right there. Someone's bike was there, right? Wow, perfect example. And this is a middle-class neighborhood, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I had the opportunity to meet Derek, the owner of a local family-owned laundromat in Oakland, California. His store had been hit by a crime wave so severely that he had to leave the state for himself and his family's safety. As I continued listening to his story, I couldn't believe my ears. So you're looking at, you know, at least a couple thousand dollars in damage, right? Here comes the second one. So this is one of the most egregious ones. They used a stolen truck to ram through the front of the store. This is almost 7 o'clock in the morning, as you can see. We're open. There's customers in there doing laundry. So there was $600 in the ATM. $32,000 in damage wow. is what it cost for them to each make $150. Wow. These two guys, this was the only successful one at Lake Merritt. So I had about $1,000 and $5 bills right there. So this is 7 in the morning they came in? Yes, they damaged the entire machine. All, all to get some of these quarters, right? I mean, everything left, you know, they leave it, they leave it all open. My customers can't get change. It really affects the business in more ways than just stealing it, right? They just want free money. And they have zero respect for anyone else's property. They know they're not gonna get in trouble. The penalties out here are nothing. It's all nonviolent crime. That a lot of people aren't even reporting crimes anymore. Derek has been trying to get help from the police. All those videos that I have of these crimes, there's no way to even upload them. And they won't come get them. I left the thumb drive down at the laundromat for weeks. Right, there they are. Right here they come running out. You'll see the cop right there. He's like, oh, okay. There's a cop right there in the car. No effort. There's zero attempt these days because why? According to, you know, California leaders, that's not a violent crime. And I get it, they're busy. They have more important things to do. And property crime in California is not important to the politicians. You know, probably the best way I can put it is look at uh, Karen Bass, mayor in Los Angeles, she said California was safe. Then her house was burglarized, two guns stolen, and suddenly she reversed and said, no, yeah. Los Angeles isn't safe. When it affects you personally, then your perspective changed. And unfortunately, we have legislators that seem so disconnected from uh, what's actually happening in the state that uh, they're, they're naive or just uh, out of touch with the reality. There is a philosophy that has been embraced by the California legislature that is criminals first, and that it's not fair to people to put them into custody and hold them accountable for their actions. It's as though the legislature doesn't understand the criminal justice system, and yet they feel free to tinker with it anyways. The final straw for Derek was when criminals came to his home. You feel vulnerable in your own home as well, right? I mean, this is, the 5 p.m. on a Sunday. You can see up here, you can kind of see my truck right there. You can just see the tail end of it. And there goes my truck. So I took off after them. And I take off. So right on the other side of this hill right here, I pull up alongside of him. And at some point he realizes, oh, this is the owner of the truck. He sideswipes me like this, turns me sideways, and I spin out. And he starts pushing me up the hill. At some point, I come off, and he jumps out of the car. I jump out of the car, and I tackle him. And as we're wrestling on the ground and stuff, please show up. They arrest him. The guy with the white truck gets away for that day. The other guy goes to jail for two days and then gets released out of jail, right? So I don't know what ended up happening. I mean, In this case, months, it was the uh, victim of the crime catches the person, something fairly ser serious, trying to run them over with, the, with their stolen vehicle, and yet they're released within a couple days. And it's essentially a revolving door. I mean, you got to pick a better time to steal someone's car. But it just shows how much they don't care. Because they know they're not going to get in trouble. 
they just happened to pick the one guy in Moraga that would do something. Had it been not you, they probably would have gotten away, right? Oh, yeah. Had it been somebody else around here, they probably would have just got away with it. The Oakland police chief says a revolving door is partially to blame for the violent crime across the city. Criminals get out too soon on bail, and then they're ready to commit more crimes. KTVU's Amber Lee. The criminal justice system here in the state of California is broken. safe do you feel walking on the streets of Los Angeles? From a scale of 1 to 10. I do feel safe. I would say a 10. I feel safe. In LA's history, the last 10 years, which is the safest, the decade on record. Crime dropped significantly. Shoplifting dropped significantly. We're safer than we were 20, 30 years ago. We're funding hundreds of millions to tackle the root causes of crime. That is the California way. Violent crime is way up here in Los Angeles at a rate we haven't seen in decades. We're living in increasingly dangerous times. It really does seem like crime is everywhere. It is chaotic. Take a look. String of smash and grab robberies have Los Angeles on edge. Watches stolen at gunpoint drivers and expensive cars targeted violent robberies on the rise. Crime has worsened in recent years. And that poll also found that more than 40% of people surveyed would like to move out of the city in the next few years. Many already have. When I was growing up with my dads, there was like never any break-ins. And now there's been about 10 to 12 just at Lake Merritt. My dad's had four or five at his, and my sister's had about four or five at her, and that's just this year alone. It's, it's gone to a place where you can't live your life the way you want to live your life here anymore. I don't feel like anybody really wanted to leave, but at the same time, nobody really wanted to be here either. You know, we left all of our friends behind. Well, it was a big deal. Derek's story left me wondering if I was in over my head. My own experiences with crime in California paled in comparison. But crime is just only a part of it. If a person grows up and does not learn that there are consequences for their actions, then they become an adult that believes there are no consequences for their actions. And when the criminal justice system does not hold that... Government data reveals an unfortunate trend. There is a correlation between when educational institutions are underperforming high dropout rate with the surge in criminal activity. Almost 70% of inmates in the California prison system do not have a high school diploma. I mean, imagine that, 70%. Lock it down, lock it down. If we don't transform failing schools in which disproportionately high poverty, African-American, Latino kids are trapped in failing schools, you're going to find illicit activity, drug running, crime, et cetera. So they go hand in hand. Education is not working in California. We've got the lowest scores in the nation, and we have the most expensive school system. So funding is not the issue. It's what we're doing with that money and who's controlling it. So the Department of Education keeps a website. Don't go to it because I have a PhD. I was the chair of the education committee. It is the most 
convoluted, I think intentionally obscure website that makes it hard for people to know how bad the schools are. So there's another source, EdSource. Here is a really interesting matrix, and it starts at 2015 to 2022. So that's seven years. You would think that in seven years, we would be doing better, right? That's not the response. Let's take a look at this year, 2022, 16% of African-American students. That's less than two out of 10 wow. kids who are at standards. In other words, eight of them are not performing at, at metric standards. For Latino students, it's 21%. Overall, Caucasian students, white students, it's higher, significantly higher, but still less than this half of white Caucasian students in California are just even meeting the standards when it comes to mathematics. So we have a problem when half of our students and sometimes significantly more than half of our students are not performing at great standards. So I started working on this way back since 1998 when I first went to the legislature. These numbers haven't moved even though almost half of the entire state budget, billions and billions and billions of dollars go into the public education system. These are the results. The numbers show a dark picture of a system that's in crisis. We've never seen so many people leave California schools like we've seen now. The California Department of Education, their numbers in the last two years, they've lost 271,000 students. And that's their numbers. When I talk to some education experts around the state, they feel it's almost double that. They feel it's closer to a half a million students. But beyond the surface of the statistics, there are actual students and families facing the consequences of a failed system. A couple of years ago, I decided, having been born and raised here, that I just couldn't see continuing to raise my daughter in this state. She was tested and she ranked among the ninth to 12th percentiles in every single subject. They weren't apt to handle a child who lies on the, the top end of the spectrum. Nicole Canyon, a business owner in the Bay Area, California, made the difficult decision to move to Florida just a year ago. She felt that she had no other choice as the local school system was unable to meet her daughter's need. Traditionally in school, you have a math sheet that's worth 20 points and you miss X amount you take the percentage, that's your grade. In the school that she was going to, it was, well, there's no grade for it. If you do it, you do it. And if you don't, oh well. And we're not gonna check your work to see if it's correct and see if you've even done it right. So what's the point of even doing it? So it's this vicious cycle of, well, it's not gonna get a grade, so why should I even do it? Some may say budget cuts. Others say that, you know, it's, it's racist to have classes for more advanced students because not everybody's advanced. We need, you know, classes that every student can take and every student can pass. They introduced a new policy that they called standard-based grading policy two years ago. That means, okay, if you cannot pass the exam, that's fine. I will give you another chance to pass it. If you cannot pass the second time, I'll give you the third time until you pass it. And that's okay if you don't uh, submit your homework uh, on time. As long as you can submit your homework uh, by the end of the semester, you're all good. It looks very rosy, right? But it destroys uh, the urgency of the students. And after two years, many parents just complain that my kids used to uh, submit homework on time, and now they just don't feel like they want to do homework anymore. And at the same time, you see pressure on some of these teachers. I've spoken to a teacher that had senior classes taken away from him because he refused to pass students that didn't have passing grades. But that's not preparing children for the real world. Nicole said her daughter's education has improved since moving to Florida. 
But what's the consequence for California if more families are forced to make similar decisions? You wonder who will build the bridges? Where will the engineers come from if we don't have the advanced classes? Some students are suited for advanced classes and some aren't, but I think it's important to have advanced classes, especially if we want to grow as a state or as a nation to compete. Californians really care, and we spend a lot of money on education every year. Almost 23,000 per student per year. 10 years ago, this number was less than $10,000. So if money isn't the problem, what is? This is a system in the name of education that works for the adults. And there are a lot of adults in the system. Superintendents, principals, teachers, coaches, you know, even the bus drivers, when you put them in as well. But the most powerful entity is the California Teachers Association. They have 350,000 members. That's a lot of people. And you think they're each paying about $1,000 a year. That's a lot of money. To influence politics, money talks. They could talk a lot. According to InfluenceWatch.org, the California Teachers Association, CTA, spent nearly $212 million to influence California's voters and public officials between January 1, 2000 and December 31, 2009. That's more than the spending of the pharmaceutical, oil, and tobacco industries combined. And their influence has kept growing from top to bottom. In 2022, CTA spent $2.8 million funding 287 school board candidates in 125 school districts. According to Manhattan Institute, candidates backed by the union win in 7 out of 10 races. So why does all this matter? Well, school boards are really important in making sure that the community's voice is heard when it comes to education. They help make sure that the values, views, and desires of the local community are represented and that people have a chance to have a say in how education is shaped in their district. The California Teachers Association, CTA, on the other hand, has a more narrow focus. They advocate for teachers. School boards hire and fire the superintendent who acts like a CEO of each school district, and who in turn hires and fires the teachers and administrators, who in turn are protected by the unions. The unions in turn donate a lot of money to elect school board members who control their boss, the superintendent, who also has to carry out the policies that the state leaders impose. But these policies are in turn made by the state leaders who get a lot of donations by the teacher unions. Do you see the picture? To me, it looks like what started out maybe with good intentions has become a power structure with our teachers caught right in the middle of it and our kids are paying the price. Every time we have an inter-district transfer, you know, the district comes to fight. The parents come with a child or sometimes with an attorney or sometimes just a friend who speaks well, and the district sends somebody, sometimes an attorney, sometimes a superintendent, you know, whomever they decide, and they each, you know, three-minute opening remarks, two-minute closing remarks, and then the board asks questions. And one particular district that's basic eight always reminds us that they get no additional money for children. And so children that are not in their tax district, you know, that's their policy. They basically tell us it's all about money and the children don't matter. And my colleagues and myself, we just, we look at each other and we can't believe it. I ran for Paloma College Board and the teachers union there, Paloma Faculty Federation, they didn't want me to be there sitting in the board. So they invested uh, more than $65,000 to my opponent, and uh, they recruited volunteers to campaign for her. So, and for regular citizen like me, we don't have this kind of resource consistently uh, to compete with them. And, and they have the financial interest. So to me, it's a, it's a corruption. 
The teachers union is the number one source of political power and money in California. If you don't tow the union line, the CTA line, the teachers line, the party line, you're basically out of office. People are leaving California. They're fleeing, you know, housing, crime, homelessness. We know what the problems are, but it's the will. Do I have the courage to take on special interests and do the right thing? And sadly, it doesn't happen. So we allow this same system to replicate itself, education being the biggest chunk, but you can add everything else into it as well. As more and more people leave the state, it's not only a loss of tax revenues, the greatest loss to an area, to a state, is uh, the loss of human capital. Not just jobs or business, but personally, human capital. That's the greatest source of wealth. And if graduate students that don't even stay in California, but move to Texas and Florida, it will have a negative impact that is magnified because we're losing our best and brightest. How many of you, when you graduate, plan to leave and go to another state? Okay, why do you plan to leave? I think everything's too expensive and I I just don't like a lot of things about it. Oh, ah, okay. That's what a lot of people, you're not, you're not alone. And a lot of people think they're being taxed to death and you may not be worried about that now, but when your income increases, your personal income goes up and you find yourself paying 15% uh, in personal income tax rate over and above the federal rate, you may decide, let me move to Florida, Texas, maybe uh, Nevada, where the state income tax rate is zero. <laughs> so people are moving with their feet. But We've known that more people are moving out of California than moving into the state uh, since 2011. So it's been with us now for 10 years. But businesses are leaving the state because of high regulation and high taxes. And as those businesses leave the state, people lose their jobs and then follow the jobs outside of the state. And it turns out that California net net has lost 18, in, in 2019, has lost $18 billion of AGI. That means there's less income, less tax revenue, and less spending, and uh, a less vibrant California economy. And as I saw all of this happening, I was like, I, I, I can't be the only person who's seeing this. And so I started a Facebook group called Leaving California in September of 2018. And it, it, it grew slowly, but what I would do is put articles in there about uh, businesses that were leaving, people that were leaving, and understanding they were fleeing the high regulation, the high taxes, uh, and, and most of them reluctantly. Most people did not want to leave. I don't think the California legislator sees that business leader as someone who's important to the puzzle. I mean, there were some, some famous highness remarks made about Elon Musk, and we really don't need Mr. Musk in California. And Mr. Musk, he left. I loved California, but being a business owner in the state of California, it is not employer friendly. And my entire family is leaving sister's already gone with her two kids. My husband's already gone. I'm leaving in April. Brother and my sister-in-law are leaving in April. My sister-in-law's family is leaving. We're all leaving. I think the government of California thinks of the taxpayers as an ATM machine. You want more money? Just go back to the ATM machine. Just go take more. You just take more. The regulations are um, true business impediments. Some business owners refer to the state of California as the Department of Business Prevention. We have the PAGA law, Private Attorney General Act. Where an attorney can become the general attorney of the state and represent the state against a business. And it could be for something really small, like, oh, you, you had a typo on the paycheck for a certain period of time. You had this typo and you paid everybody the same amount but there was a typo that cost us i i think we ended up paying out 
a little over $30,000 plus our attorney's fees. So it was 37 bucks or something that we didn't pay an employee. We didn't realize it and he never said anything and then a few months later we got served with a PAGA claim. And $30,000 may not seem like a lot of money to some people, but to a small business, family business, that'll make or break you. Well, and I think our legal fees were almost equal to that. So, you know, out of pocket about $60,000. Um, you can't make a mistake. Any lawyer can come along and file a lawsuit against any business for violating these different aspects of the labor code, which is something like a thousand pages. Instead of having a law that allows businesses to cure the violation and go about their business, no, it's going to be a big shakedown from private attorneys who say, I'm gonna file this unless you settle with me. And this is particularly rough on small businesses. You know, it's all starting to come back. So he was a current employee when he filed, so he was not an ex-employee. So we were in the middle of closing the facility where he worked. We had to keep him employed because we can't retaliate. And so he basically became, I can do whatever I want because they can't do anything. So, you know, we're trying to take care of people with special needs. We're trying to operate a business. We've got a pocket claim and we've got an employee that is out of control and there's nothing we can do. So that's one example of how the PAGA law creates an unfriendly business climate. And there are lawyers who make a really good living finding these little details and looking for ways to shake down businesses for settlements. Once they open a PAGA claim, they look for a laundry list of things wrong because the more things they can find wrong with an employer, the more money they can get. You know, I had one employee from Texas calling me. He's like, you need to pay me my money or I'm going to sue you too. And it was like, I don't owe you any money. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, pay you what money? Um, I mean, if we underpay someone by $30, they should be required first to go to their employer and figure it out with their employer. If you notice that you have a discrepancy on your paycheck, or if there's something that you don't understand, you should immediately be able to go. That should be the first step of period. All of the paperwork, dealing with the attorney, sending in all the information while we still have a business to operate with no secretary, no administrative help, was very difficult. At one point, we employed almost 50 Californians and had 25 beds to serve people with developmental disabilities. That, that's a lot, and that shows how much we were committed to a population in the state of California that most people don't care about. But when you're up against a state and you're up in, against, I don't know, it just changes your whole view. It's like, why am I going to work so hard for a state that doesn't work hard for me? They are very punitive and they're very nasty to businesses, and they're very nasty to taxpayers in California. And the general sense is that California treats businesses like criminals and taxpayers like organ donors. And people get tired of it, and they begin to feel ground down. And then they talk to someone in another state where it's not like that, and that's why people are leaving. You know, if we're talking about comparing California, Arizona, or California to Texas, or, or, or pick a state, one looks at what the, what is occurring in the state, what the legislate, you know, what the legislature in that state is doing. And California is, right, wrong, or indifferent, prioritizing social issues. And I don't know the history of laws. Like, I don't know the history of how much the employee laws have changed. What I do know is that our employee handbook went from 12 pages to 60 pages in less than 10 years. Today's hearing one is in person. You know, it's the old joke that you're always in terrible danger when the legislature is in session. But we seem to see that. I mean, every time the legislature is in session, we seem to see more proposals that are anti-business. We used to have a legislature full of business owners, small business owners, people who were in top positions in a company who understood the importance of the private sector and appreciated what businesses had to go through to either open up a business or stay in business. We recently at Chapman, along with uh, UCI and UCLA uh, and UCSD, the University of California at San Diego, we worked together to formulate a questionnaire 
that we sent out to chief executive officers of companies throughout the state. And we asked them, how, how do you feel about doing business in California? What are the prospects of your business relocating out of the state? And we're coming back with uh, as many as 50% of the CEOs suggesting that we're planning to leave California in the future. Uh, why? The two things that were cited, high taxes and high regulation, and the second thing, high housing prices. California, a little bit of paradise. Beautiful. Productive. Exciting. Growing. Many influences have joined together to mold the California we know today. What is this California way of life? After World War II, California was still a relatively new state, and so the 40s were a period of building, working together to build something. The 50s was enjoying middle-class America, and people in California were harmoniously working together in a new state, new way of life, single-family homes and single-family neighborhoods. You had opportunity. Here, the residents lead happier lives, healthier lives, that directly benefit for home and industries where they work. When my grandparents were starting their family, my grandmother was a stay-at-home mom, and my grandfather did not have a, a full college education. And he drove around Los Angeles delivering bread, and that was his job. And they were able to make life work such that they were able to purchase a home. It wasn't handed to them. They had to want it and plan to own a home, but it was within reach for them. It was possible, it was on the table, and it was absolutely a normative option for people in their same situation. Oh my gosh. Three million dollars. Those are larger, but this is like a normal house. Like, we walk by this house. 1.2 million dollars. Even though we're working hard, even though we're trying our best, we'll never be able to achieve the life that our parents achieved or our grandparents achieved. So that's where the homes are. The housing market is outpacing even my my ardent savings efforts, um, I think it just, it makes people feel discouraged and it makes people feel like the environment around them isn't the fertile soil it once was to create a great life for, for themselves and for their children and grandchildren. Things were relatively easy to build in California in the 60s and 70s. I think that's where we got our reputation as this kind of land of opportunity in California, the California dream. People could move here, they could create a great life. That is very hard to find today because of the cost of housing. And every year since 1970, whether it's the environmental laws like CEQA or whether it's uh, local laws like uh, zoning laws, they've gotten more complicated, more dense, more expensive to comply with and they allow less and less building. The number one reason why I stopped developing housing in California was that in order to get projects approved, it was so long and so expensive that a small developer like myself doesn't have the capital to buy a piece of land and hold it for two or three or four years to see if it'll get approved. California, if you want to rezone property, have it annexed in, it has to go through a certain process, an environmental impact report process. That process is like documents that I have that are just, you know, pages and pages thick, all sorts of different reports that you have to pay to get done. And anybody who's not even a neighbor, not even near, can sue and say they don't agree with how you were solving that problem in that environmental impact report. In other states, if you want to sue, you have to have some standing. Here, 
anybody can sue to stop a development from going forward. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, I've seen cases of millions of dollars of litigation fees in order to block the project. And you often end up with projects that just don't get built because they're no longer economically feasible due to CEQA. Or it's built five, seven, ten. I've seen a case of 40 years of litigation in order to get permits finally approved. So you can imagine if in order to build something, you can't just buy the land, hire the contractors, get the materials, bring all of your innovation and business savvy and build something, but you've got to wade your way through a decade of court. Who's going to build in California? You have to find a way to pay for the land and all the lawsuits and all the things you went through, so you will have to charge more for the other homes that you're building. So essentially, when you buy a home, you're paying a lawyer as some sort of a fee that you don't know about and you didn't see. We're funding lawyers through our housing costs. But then you also have a thing where the restrictions of growth. You look at maps, you see the map, and it shows the town kind of where they grew out to, and they kind of all stop it at, at a certain street or whatever. They say, you can't build outside this imaginary line until this all gets filled in over the next 20 or 30 years. Meanwhile, there's a farm right across the street that farmland is one-tenth of the cost of residential land, and that could have houses on it, or a lot of houses, which would bring the prices down because you'd have competition. They don't want to talk about the things that the market seems to want to pay for if people were just free to build it, which is, you know, more smaller, uh, maybe duplexes and triplexes, maybe more single family homes, maybe more suburbs. They really don't want that as a solution. Some of the disconnect here is the fact that the people who make our laws live in very different places in a very different style than the people who are suffering with the housing crisis that we've talked about. If you live in San Francisco, you may imagine it would be fine if every place looked like San Francisco, but that's not actually what people want. That's why they're also saying that if you're on a major thoroughfare that has a bus going up and down it, you as a developer aren't required to have any parking. Now that makes no sense. This is not New York City where there's subways and all this interconnection and four blocks over and get to a subway station. This is Southern California, which is spread out. But actually, that's only part of the story. In recent years, vehicle miles traveled was added as an impact under CEQA. And the meaning of this is, if you want to build a community of houses in an outlying area, the bureaucrats will calculate how many residents will be commuting to work, how many vehicle miles traveled it's going to generate. And this now is an impact and you can't build your community. 1% of the global climate emissions come from California. This is almost a religious obsession that environmentalists are pushing on people and on politicians who are pushing it on us. Do you have to have a solar system? Yeah. Do you have to have um, air conditioning that's very efficient, more expensive? Do you um, have to have construction techniques that are more expensive? So yeah, you'll have all that, which makes the actual cost higher. The special interests in California have a huge impact on legislation because uh, similar, to the, similar to regulations, which usually uh, somebody has the bright idea of imposing regulations on people in their industry to keep others out or, or kind of stifle their business, special interest does that with legislation. One of the examples, of course, is, uh, you know, solar heating or solar energy now is mandatory on every new home built in California. I just paid for a solar system on a home that I'm building and uh, didn't even realize it was mandatory. The way the rooftop solar subsidies are currently set up in California, people who do not have rooftop solar on their homes are subsidizing people with rooftop solar to the tune of 30 to $50 a month. And it's, it's unfair. It's unfair because some people can't afford rooftop solar, some people don't have the right kind of home to be able to install rooftop solar. Some people rent and the owner of their rental unit simply will not install rooftop solar. And some people live in the shade and so rooftop solar is simply not a viable option for them. Every envelope you open from a utility has a warning in it that you're using too much of something. You're creating too much garbage or you're using too much electricity or you're using too much water. These basic services that government is supposed to provide. Picking up the trash, making sure that when you plug your iPhone into the wall, 
it charges. These are basic services in other places, but in California, it's a giant guilt trip. And then when they raise your rates, people are saying, well, at least they let me use water. The thing to look at is who are you losing? So California is, is becoming more stratified where the wealthy are staying because they can be here and they don't have to worry about crime or other things. They have gated communities. N nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying they don't have to worry about things that the middle class has to worry about. And then if you're the poor in California, your life is more subsidized than, let's say, the middle class person is. If we don't change our ways, the middle class will not be able to afford to live here. And we already see this. We know that people who are struggling to make ends meet will forego medication and make other sacrifices in order to be able to pay for both their housing and their electricity and other energy costs. My electric bill would normally be $50. They added another 49, one for the clean air electric and the other one just regular fees. So yeah. It's, it's disheartening to know that the government is doing that, adding on. Marilyn Rivera is a single grandmother and property manager who makes about $60,000 a year. This is my office right here. She's deciding to leave the state because the cost of living is so high here. It doesn't give anybody any room to get sick, to take a day off of work, to have an accident, to have an unforeseen circumstance like, like I did. So we can go. I had to go ahead and take custody of my grandson and fight for him. During that four years, I maxed out my credit cards, putting down for retainer fees, my savings, my retirement. I ended up getting more and more bills. And it just, it's a domino effect. Despite her situation, she's not getting any government support. I've applied for food stamps. When I give them all my information, they're like, oh, we can't count this, we can't count this, we can't count this. And they're like, nope, you're making this. But I'm not taking home that because they're, they actually go by your gross. They don't go by what you take home. I'm considered single in the state of California and they take everything from me. They give to, to the ones that know how to work the system and the ones that really need it. You don't, you don't have access to it. You don't have access to it. She has three jobs. She's doing whatever she can. She doesn't have any free time. From what it looks like, she's spending all her free time on making these soaps, writing books, and she's trying so hard to make it. I've written to every state representative here, and what's funny is you don't even get that generic correspondence that they give to constituents. You don't even get that. But if I had a chance, I'd, I'd tell them, hey, live a day or two in our shoes. It's, it's not easy when you have to just eat oatmeal <laughs> when you see top, toppers pizza or something coming through and your grandson's like oh I, I'd like to have that in a sense Marilyn's story represents 3.3 million households in California that's about 25 percent of households in California that have no cushion for any expense that's unforeseen. California is reporting a drop in the state's populations. A lot of it has to do with cost of living. When I go to my favorite restaurants that were just normal food, that I, my everyday restaurants that I used to go to when I live here, uh, a lunch is 30 bucks now, you know? But when you've got you know $30 for a, an average lunch and you've got $7 at the pump, in your one bedroom apartment is 2700 in North Hollywood. So let's take a normal community that's a Fresno County or Kings County or Tulare County where I live. If you go to an August average August afternoon, it's about 108 and you will see people go into the local Walmart and they're not going there to purchase things. They're going there to find free air conditioning because they can't afford, even at subsidized rates for being poor, they can't afford to turn on their air conditioning because the rates are so high. The rates are so high, deliberately so, so that people will not use air conditioning. And they're set by people who live here. Notice in this office, I don't have any air conditioning. Which we're in Stanford right now. Yes, yeah. we're at Stanford. And so the people who set policy, whether it's on electric prices or fuel prices, they're never subject to the consequences of their own ideology. To reduce greenhouse gas emissions marginally in this state, 
We have this very expensive program called cap and trade, which is a hidden tax on energy. It's on refineries, it's on utilities, it's on manufacturing, it's on everything. So this extra tax, it adds to the price of gasoline, it adds to the price of diesel fuel, it adds to the price of everything that's made or moved in California. Your electric bill, your water bill, in California, water is pumped around the state with electric pumps, so part of the cost of water is the cost of electricity. It is raising the cost of living in California throughout the economy. Now, if we're going to pay more for utilities, we should be using the money to fix the infrastructure or to fix the drinking water quality in some places, and we're not. We're just paying it to this greenhouse gas reduction fund in Sacramento. And what happens to the money in that? It's being used to build the bullet train. The bullet train, which was promised to be from San Francisco to Los Angeles and is currently scheduled one day to go from Madera to Bakersfield. But also what, what's happening is it's almost as if they're trying to outdo each other with these hyperbolic pieces of legislation that are passing. The governor just signed 40 climate change bills. 40 climate change bills, and frankly, we are the cleanest state in the entire country. There's no other jurisdiction in the world that's doing what the state of California is doing. Gas mowers will one day be a thing of the past. A revolutionary plan that would ban the sale of new gas-powered vehicles. Ban on gas stoves. Banning new gas leaf blowers. Gas water heaters along with ending the sales of all gas furnaces by the year 2030. And so they're always going to worry about some guy who's Mexican-American down in Mendota who's driving a 1981 diesel pickup. And they're going to say, you know what? If you don't put your DEF additive into that old car and retrofit it for $5,000, we're going to make you take that off the road. But they think nothing of flying to Davos or overseas in a private jet. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Dory Stiamak, nice meeting you. Dory. Nice meeting nice you. Nice to meet Jim, you, Stiamak. Very nice it's a meeting pleasure. you. Yeah, it's great to what meet you. What do you think you. of the Georgetown Divide? It's awesome. It's great. It's very a beautiful, beautiful, place. beautiful place. We moved um, the first part of August of last year, so we've been gone just over a little over a year. You know, we are living here in Georgetown on the uh, uh, Georgetown Divide, and uh, it's all timber, it's all trees. We just got a note one day that so we're not, we're, we're canceling you. And they give you a number for the California Fair Plan. It's your only option. Yeah, a lot of people's insurance were dropped just because you're in the trees. Just about the, everybody yeah. up here. So, but you know that, and then in the politics. One of the things that I realized working on this documentary is that when you when we think about politics, to the little people, politics about is it their problems? Can you solve my problem? I have this problem. Can you do you care about me? Will you answer my call when I reach out to you? You know, it's, 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 it's very simple. And it's just, it went from being a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. Why was your insurance coverage dropped? Because of fire danger. It started down in the canyon and it burned up to the north to the town of Forest Hill. And it burned right up to the town. Then it came back down, it came up this side of the canyon and it really blew up coming up here and that's when they started evacuating people. It burned everything in its path. It was quite intense, it, it really steep um, grades and hills and canyons. So fire tends to really race uphill about 40% faster than um, downhill while well, than other directions and especially with the wind pushing it. It was a very hot fire. Since there hadn't been a fire, a significant fire in that area for many, many years, it burned much more intensely because the fuel was available and it, it burned everything in its path. And we've had environmental policies for decades, federal and state, that say don't clean up the forest and the wildlands. Just let it grow. Don't clean it up, just leave it be. Well, now we're reaping the rewards of that. So by overprotecting the forest and the wildlands. We've harmed them. The fuel has grown out of control. You know, they, for years here in California, they've had this hands-off, 
you know, mentality, you know, oh, you can't disturb, you know, you know, don't, don't touch our trees. You know, like there's some sacred cow. You're not supposed to rake the, the pine needles away from the base of a tree. It's just a mess. I mean, d trees fall down, they rot, you know, and pine cones and limbs and, you know. It's it would, really it, thick with vegetation. Are these burn. trees dead now? Or yes, they're... yeah, they're all, they're all, if they're not dead, they're gonna be dead. Burn everything, it's all gone. They predicted that, that it was gonna burn to the Northwest, which was us. It was gonna take us out. The house, a quarter mile from us, they were evacuated. You know, and then we had our son, Joey, and tell him about his medical equipment. We'd have to set oh, that up in our, like, in our RV, in the travel trailer. Nine pieces of equipment, plus all of his medical supplies, and things you can't, things you can't just, if you forget, run down to Walmart and grab. I mean, it's all prescription stuff, and so we had to uh, make sure we had all of that. And then we had my parents next door, which they were both disabled, so it was, you know, getting them ready to evacuate. You know, the vegetation will come back and, you know, you'll start seeing seedlings, trees coming back. Look at the tree like this. It's all burnt. Wow, this is very sad to see this, even inside. In geologic time or even the forest time, you know, 15, 20 years is, is not much. In our lifetime, 15, 20 years is a long time. And I can see how it'd be very frustrating uh, for somebody who's living out there because you, you buy and you build because of the natural beauty of the forest and then a forest fire comes through and changes all that. It's heartbreaking because we're here to protect and serve. And that is a failure point that for some reason, we weren't able to um, do what we needed to do to protect those people there. You can get into a long list, of, okay, they didn't do enough work themselves or they built in the wrong place. But, but as a firefighter, I still see that as a point of failure on our part. My hometown is Santa Cruz, California. Oh, okay. And she was born in the Bay Area, lived in a town called Woodside. Okay. And uh, she came up here. Or, well, the, she had family friends up here. What if you were house. like in charge of this whole thing in the state? They told you you can't fix <laughs> this problem. What would you do? <laughs> Probably jump off that bridge you were talking about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have all the answers. And, you know, I'm just. Uh, you know, a blue collar guy here in you know, Georgetown, now in Nevada. But there, you know, it's the, Gavin Newsom signed a, a, a bill or declaration or a decree. No new internal combustion vehicles are gonna be sold in the state of California as of 2035. And they're telling us now that uh, to turn swamp cooler and your air conditioner off because they don't, you know, the, the grid doesn't have the power. Or they shut the power off and then you know, most people will turn their generator on, but if they outlaw the sale of generators, they aren't gonna be able to do that for power. <laughs> Did you guys uh, have that issue happen? Did you ever lose power here? Oh, oh yeah, all, all the time. time. Yeah. Yeah. When the wind blows, they shut the power off. When it snows, the power, the power goes. goes out. Um, in the summertime, if it's high fire season, they shut the power off. But we had a swamp cooler. Well, the only way you can run a swamp cooler is you gotta have water and you have to have electricity. You know, and you get up here and it's 105 degrees in the summertime and you can't have the swamp cooler on. It gets pretty miserable in the house, especially in the evening when you're gonna try to go to sleep. Yeah, and a lot of people up here are getting whole house generators. I mean, everybody's got a generator up here. You know, you have to, because the power's off constantly. Was it like this five years ago, 10 years ago? No. These people are not political. It seems like the state and the leaders are in such a kind of elitist, like disconnected place. They're trying to solve different kinds of problems that we, that average Californians don't have. So what do you miss about this place? The trees, <laughs> ironically, the shade, the trees. I mean, it's beautiful here, especially if you go up in the high country, you know, you get up there and there's less trees. It's more, you know, it's, there's more granite. And, uh, you know, California is the most beautiful state in the union. You know, but it's just that the, the way they govern, they're governing, it's just ruined it for me.
The disconnect is the politicians are not on the same page as the people. They don't want solutions. A lot of them are making money off our problems. If they solved our problems, a lot of them would be out of business. Their campaigns wouldn't have the money to create the legislation they're creating, which has nothing to do with solving the problems. It was hard to wrap my head around some of the things I learned throughout this journey. But then at other times, you kind of just don't want to understand it, even though it's right in front of you. There's people that are making their careers feeding off of the homeless. You look at the nonprofits, the 501c3, that's a whole shadowy world of organizations with CEOs making $800,000 a year, uh, managers, directors pulling in 200,000 plus. But that is just a tiny slice of the big picture here. Remember, you spend six and a half billion dollars over 10 years only to see your problem double in size. Didn't go to help the homeless for sure. Where'd the money go? There was a measure in LA that passed seven years ago in 2016, and they were supposed to build 10,000 homes to house 20,000 homeless people. And each home was supposed to cost 120,000. Up to today, each home is five times the original budgeted cost, and they've only built like 1,000, 1,100 homes. But if it takes 10 years, 15 years to house these people, by that time, those people may not even be alive. There's people that are trying to sell it like it's an affordable housing crisis. Not at all. If you're smoking meth 24-7, rent could be a nickel a month and you couldn't afford it. And they're failing, completely failing to look at the real reasons why the majority of people we see are on the streets. It's almost like it's taboo to say that it's drugs or mental illness. In places like Skid Row, we have uh, drug dealers who control every block. Uh, so if, you, if a homeless person tries to set up an encampment on a particular street, what he or she doesn't know if that block is controlled by a drug dealer. So if they try to set up, the drug dealer's gonna say, what are you doing here? Well, you're gonna say, I'm homeless, I need a place to stay. Well, no, this is my block. So here's what you have to do. You either pay me your entire social security check to stay here, or you house my women for sex work, hold my drugs, sell my drugs for me. And if you don't do that, you're gonna get assaulted until you leave. And what happens with that is places like Skid Row become too dangerous to be homeless in. So a lot of these individuals go in for a short time, but then they leave and set up encampments in other parts of the county and other counties across Southern California. And now you're having many Skid Rows pop up. And as those get more dangerous, guess what? Those people are going to start to break off and create another encampment. So, but no, you can't just come and set up in Skid Row without being approached or accosted by a gang member or a drug dealer. So I went to talk to an expert, somebody that has been working on the ground on the homeless issue. Sorry about that. His name is Zach Southall. You like white socks or black socks? He's so close to the ground. They're all like, they're all the small ones. But I got those ones and I got these cool hill figure ones too. Day in and day out, he's going out there, helping the homeless people. He's building relationships with them. He's trying to find oh, out waters. why they ended up in this situation, get to their heart and help them. And uh, he doesn't get a penny from the state government. So uh, chicken and pasta? It's pretty good. We just got it picked it up from the kitchen. Would you like a water? Like that. Got like a oh here's a uh, fork and knife and stuff too. I'm Zach by the way. But like what happens is if we come too late um, everybody gets really high and then nobody knows who I am and I it's like kind of a <laughs> it's kind of a useless endeavor to be here if I can't make connections and, and forge relationships. You know what I mean? That's what the whole, that's what the food's about. You know, like the, it, I'm not just trying to feed people. I, I want to, I really want to get them off the street. So if I, I can't do that unless we have a, a meaningful conversation. And I, unfortunately, you know, I can't, uh, can't have a meaningful, a meaningful conversation with someone who's super high, like that, that girl at the bench, you know, unfortunately, who I've talked to before, but right now she's just, 
she's just on a bender right now, so she can hardly even do anything, which is which is sad. The majority of the people that I work with, uh, with the homeless, you know, they're dealing with some kind of trauma, heartbreak. That's it's a depth. It's an issue. It's a heart issue. It's not this surfacey. Oh, let's just get him off this drug and he'll be fine. Uh, just, it, it won't work. It's kind of like the it's the merry-go-round system again. He'll yeah, he'll be clean for a little bit and then he'll fall right back into it. It's just like you you didn't address the root cause of the issue, and that's what I I think that our focus has been and continues to be getting to that root cause. What what is that? That's the only way that works is to get to that. And that's so tough. That's so tough. That requires investment in people that government's not ready to make, and they're not good at, frankly. Hey, Bree. How you doing? I, uh, you already got some lunch? Yeah, I got lunch. Oh, you got hooked up. You got the donuts and everything, too, huh? No way, dude. That's rad. How, do, how did you sneak by me? I didn't even see you. How are you to talk to Jerry? Oh, I was? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say hi. Are you okay? Is everything going okay? Uh, yeah, sorry. Well, do you have my number still? Because I wanted to, you know, I want to help whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. So you have it? Yeah. All right. Is there anything else I can get for you? I mean, is there anything else I can do? I mean, right now I'm pretty good, I think. Okay, cool. I got pretty much everything I need. All right, I got a couple gift cards, like uh, Starbucks, and uh, Starbucks is dope, right? I mean, uh, the coffee, or I have, uh, oh, I have Subway, too. Do you like I'm Subway? I'm really a big fan of Subway. Okay, then I'm going to give you the Starbucks card. <laughs> is that cool? Yeah. Let me see. Do you need a bus pass or anything? I was just about to ask you. Perfect. I brought this for you because I, I never have bus passes and I have one right now. I got a 30 day. Oh, heck yeah. That way you can get to where you need to go. Thank All right. You. So you got to come see me one of these days. We're having real conversation that's leading to real relationship being developed and people will actually tell you what's going on, you know, and they'll actually tell you what, what happened. You'll get the real story. Then next week they see you again. Next week they see you again, next week they see you again, and eventually they're gonna trust you. And then when they're ready for a change, guess who they're gonna call? Guess who they're gonna trust with that? You. Would you guys like some lunch? Are you hungry at all? It's chicken pasta? I think there is a very prevalent thought process for m most Americans, I think, when they look at homelessness and they look at a homeless person, they think that person made some bad decisions that led them to this, and they kind of deserve what they got. How long have you been here in... in... Uh, homeless? Uh, homeless, I've been homeless for about uh, maybe 15 years or more. I've been trying to get off the streets. It's just, I don't... Even doctor recommend it. It's not good for me to go into a shelter. There's a lot of people that you would be surprised by their stories. You know, you would, and, then, and if you walked a mile in their shoes, uh, would you make it? Would you even get to where they're at? You know, or, or, would you have, or would you have fallen apart? When we were making this documentary, I actually felt somewhat depressed it, it's sad to see the state of california where we are and on top of it most people don't really know the true situation then i felt like there's no hope for california but then when i met zach um, well, I have socks. <laughs> what happens with people like Zach is that they see a problem, they go start doing something about it, and they do a little bit, whatever they can. There is a lot of challenges that somebody like Zach faces to help one person. He has to meet with so many people, has to try to build a lot of relationships. There's no help from the government, but he's just doing it out of his heart. And then I realized there's so many other people doing the same, but their stories are not told. The press is not covering them. I think the hope that it gave me is that the future of California is in the hands of these people. 
and if I can help share their stories. Maybe it will inspire more Californians to do the same.